It was the 19th century Baptist preacher, though, uh, to begin, one Charles Spurgeon. Uh, over 150 years ago, he said this. He said, doth not all nature around me praise God? If I were silent, I should be an exception to the universe. Doth not the thunder praise him as it rolls like drums in the march of the God of armies? Do not the mountains praise him when the words upon their summits wave in adoration? Doth not the lightning write his name in letters of fire? Hath not the whole earth a voice? And shall I, can I, silent be? This morning we're continuing our series, uh, Where Are You in the Crowd? We're looking at those who heard Jesus firsthand And think about what can we learn from their responses, from the crowds, if you will, um, who were there, whether it's on uh, the the shoreline um, or on the mountainside or as Jesus was passing through from town to town. And so today we turn to the reaction of praise. Jesus was praised. We we see it throughout the gospel accounts. But I want us to ask kind of a, a key question, I think, this morning as to why was he praised? What is it that caused the crowds to praise him? What what happened? What is it that took place? What was it that they witnessed, that they were the first-hand audiences of? And why did they respond in the way they did? We're going to take a look at at a a handful of examples from the Gospel, as Jenny shared last week. We're we're using Luke's Gospel on the whole throughout this series, not exclusively, Um, But I want us to consider a few moments in Luke now and ask that question. You know, what is it we can learn here today in 2023? What can we apply to our lives as disciples wherever we might be on that journey of faith? Whether we've been a believer for decades, maybe since we were very, very young and we've been around on planet Earth for a very, very long time. Maybe we've only recently come to that point of deciding to follow Jesus. Uh, maybe we're somewhere in between. Maybe it's been a bit of an up and a down uh, journey. But, but how do we take these truths and how do we apply them to our lives? So let's turn firstly to Luke and chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And I'm going to read from verses 13 to 15. Uh, the opening uh, of Luke uh, 4 details Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, tempted by the devil. Um, And I say, I'm going to pick up from verse 13. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in the synagogues, and everyone praised him. In Luke's account, this is the start of Jesus' adult ministry. Um, I say, having been tempted by the devil, he returns to Galilee. And it says he begins to teach that eyes are open wide. People's attention is grabbed. There's this sense, uh, I guess, of, of hanging on his every word. Because there was, and there still very much is, something so very different about him. He was not just some other rabbi. He wasn't just another teacher. He wasn't just another leader hoping that people would follow him. And that's why they praised him. In awe and wonder of what he communicated. You know, the way he articulated himself, um, I believe that the purpose and the power that his words carried. So let's skip forward a few chapters. Hold that thought in your mind to, to Luke 13. And let's take a look at Luke 13. I encourage you to have your Bibles open as we go through these. Uh, Luke 13, reading from uh, verse 10. Here we read, On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. 
Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? There should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. We see two responses here in this passage. The synagogue leaders, they're rather unimpressed, to say the least, um, because Jesus is healed on the Sabbath. Um, Talk about an example of missing the point, um, as Jesus clearly you know, states to them. They've lost their perspective. They've lost their way um, uh, of what actually is important and what they should be about. But then there's also the response both of the woman, when we read in verse 13, then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. That was immediate, her response. But also um, in verse 17, says the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Or as some other translations put it, uh, all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. And here, Jesus heals a woman crippled by a spirit, we're told, for 18 years. I mean, even if I just say the second, kind of, were you 18 years ago? Imagine most of us, it will take us a while to work that out. Um, you say, 18 years ago, what year was that? And then what? Um, 18 years, it's not just like a cold for a month. Um, it's not just like a broken leg or an arm um, that's going to maybe take six months, maybe a year if it's really, really bad. Um, it's not just some kind of disease that you work through and with treatment after two or three years, you're given the clean. 18 years. And if we'd have been there, we probably would have recognized her. She'd have probably been, I'm guessing, a bit of a character in the community, quite likely known um, by all who, who passed by. It says she was crippled by a spirit. Chances are there would have been some rather unsavory outworkings of that. Let's say she would have been known for sure and probably was someone who it would have deemed had little or no hope. She was just the person that we crossed over the, the track from. Uh, we ignored. We just tried to avoid. And yes, Jesus restores her on the Sabbath, which causes a bit of an issue for the synagogue leaders. But the, the focus here is both her response and that of the crowd. You know, what is witnessed and that response of praise, of rejoicing, of delight in what has taken place before their very eyes. Something they, I'm guessing, thought was never going to be even uh, a slim possibility. If we turn on a few chapters later to Luke 18, verses 35 uh, to the end. I'm not going to read it now, but you can read it later. Uh, a blind beggar receives his sight. It's a similar account in some respects uh, to that which we read just now in Luke 13. Jesus, Jesus heals this blind man. He's, he cries out, asking for mercy. Um, he's shouted down uh, by some, you know, just keep quiet. Uh, you're a bit of an annoyance. Uh, you're a bit of unsightly uh, situation in this community. Maybe that sort of thing. Uh, but even more determined, he cries out. Jesus responds, and in turn, this man is healed. And again, the response of the people, of the crowd, and of this man is to praise God because of what they've seen, because of the miraculous act that has just unfolded before their very eyes. I want us to, to look at one final passage. Um, there are many others we could uh, consider, um, but we'll just flip over to Luke 19 and the account as we know it as Palm Sunday, um, the, the Sunday before we celebrate um, Easter Sunday. Reading from Luke 19, uh, I'm going to pick up verse 36. As he went along, this is Jesus, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. 
Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And here, the people, the disciples, they're not just kind of, you know, praising him and making a, a response to, to what they've seen, although that is part of what they're doing. They're also making quite a statement here. As, you know, they enter Jerusalem, as Jesus comes in, they're declaring him as king. You know, what greater praise can you give to someone who's saying, actually, you are just something else. You are something above us. You are just something so much greater. So we see these different responses, these different encounters. The thing is, though, these responses of praise, they're pretty much all reactive. They follow the crowd, the individuals, those who were there, seeing, hearing, or experiencing Jesus do something. Or because they hope and think he's going to do something. That is why they praise him. Now, let me be very clear. There is nothing wrong with that. You know, praising God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because of something that happens. Um, something that we see, something that we hear, something we experience, whether personally um, or goes on around us. Um, you know, that is totally the right response. It's not in any way kind of a secondary sort of praise or a lesser form of praise. I want to ask the question, though. Is that enough for our praise, if it is just this, to be reactive? Or to put it another way, are we content if that is what our praise boils down to? Yeah, if praise is something that purely comes as, as a reaction to something that I see, or, or things that take place, or this expectation that God is going to move in a certain way and deliver, um, and kind of, I'll, I'll praise you because I expect this is going to happen, and you're going to do this for me, or, or whatever. I mean, let me tell you where I'm at as I've reflected on this uh, and been working through this. Personally, I'm not content with that. Or if I'm being really honest, um, I know I shouldn't be content with that. Because actually the reality is often I am quite content with that. Um, I'll praise God when something happens, when he answers my prayer, when I find a parking space, as you're doing that thing where you're driving around uh, and you're late and you need somewhere to land the car, um, or you're lost, uh, or that sort of thing. Or, or we pray for someone to be healed, um, and they get better. Um, but I don't believe praise as a reaction is what God is after. I don't believe it's actually enough. Our praise should be something that's instinctive. It should be something that's automatic. It should be foundational to, to who we are as disciples. It should be something that's proactive within us every single day. Writer J.R. Tolkien, he, he wrote this. He said, the chief purpose of life for any one of us is to increase according to our capacity and knowledge of God by any means we have and to be moved by it to praise God. And thanks. Came across that as I was preparing, and I've just had that going around my, my head. The chief purpose of life is basically to, to get to know God better, and that in turn to move me to praise God. Just because of who He is. Not because I expect Him to do something for me, um, or because I, you know, I, I feel it's going to you know, curry me favor. But what's more, I actually want to take it a step further because I actually be, believe praise should be proactive whatever is going on in our lives. Maybe this is where it might get a little bit awkward. But I don't believe our praise should simply be something that follows the fact that I'm having a good day. My week is going as planned and therefore I will praise you, God. Or, you know, it only makes an appearance in my life when things are looking up. Or, you know, it's something that I see maybe as an optional extra um, that I'll engage with if I feel like it. I don't believe that's what our praise should be about. I was listening this week uh, to the Lectio 365 daily devotional. I don't know who, who uses that from time to time. It's a great resource. Um, it's a free app. Um, and you have about a 10, 12-minute uh, audio recording, uh, devotional. Um, you can read it through if, if you'd prefer. 
But on Tuesday, they were reflected on Luke 6, 46 to 49. Um, it's the illustration Jesus uses of the wise and the foolish builders. Uh, one builder builds his house on the rock, the other on the sand. Um, the floods come, uh, and in verse 48, we read, you know, this torrent struck the house, this is built on the rock, but could not shake it because it was well built. One built upon the sand, though, in verse 49, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. Well, the comment that was made uh, in part of this was, uh, the person said, I'm struck by the fact that the flood came to both men and tested what they had built. I am not immune to tests and disasters. Life sends everyone's way. I can only try to continually dig deep into Jesus and lay a foundation in him that is strong enough to endure. Struck by it, and just want to kind of outwork that slightly differently. You know, the flood came to both men and tested what they had built. The reality is, life is tough. We face challenges. I know that from personal experience. And there'll be seasons we'll go through in life that will just be the worst, um, that will take us maybe to the, the edge of what we feel we can cope with, or, or we see things that are happening um, around us or to others. And so don't mishear me, I'm not saying that we kind of need to go around with a permanent smile on our face, and praise God, through everything. Um, or that we can't be honest with what's going on. In part, I believe that's what, what church it is about. That's what this family, the body of Christ is about. It's actually going, you know, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm facing and having others standing with me. I'm also not saying we can't be real with God. I think one of the lies the enemy tells us is that we can't be honest with how we're feeling with God. Um, because God won't appreciate it. God won't like it. Uh, God might get angry. And actually, I think we need to just be open with God, uh, however we're feeling, whatever we're going through. But once again, our praise of God should have no direct correlation with the here and now. Our praise of God should not be impacted by the things of this world. Because if we stop and think about it, we're, we're talking about praising the Creator of all things. In Revelation 21.6, God identifies himself as the Alpha and the Omega. Um, if you don't know, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Uh, Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Um, in other words, God is saying, you know, I am the beginning and the end. You know, there was none before me um, and there will be none after me because actually I am eternal. You know, a few weeks ago, Beth spoke uh, as part of our We Are Family series on being a, a worshipping community. And she explored something of the awesomeness of God. Um, and if you didn't listen to it or weren't here um, or maybe just forgotten, I'd encourage you to go back and listen again. Uh, some of what uh, she was you know, encouraging us to consider. Because it just reminds us who we're praising. Who it is we're singing to when we gather here on, on a Sunday. And who we should praise no matter what. Now, I don't even know exactly where you're at in all of this. You know, we don't do that thing on the door. Uh, we can have a kind of a numbered one to five. But you know, if you go, you, you go, usually it's service stations, you come out of the toilets and they say, you know, how was your experience? And you can vote, can't you? You know, was it really good? Was it really rubbish? Oh, we don't do that as you come in. We could say, kind of, how are you feeling today? We could get you to vote. Um, and with technology as it is today, we could probably have that. So as, you know, Emma or whoever's hosting could start off saying, well, today there's, you know, kind of, well, you know, 30 of you. You've had a really rushed week, and you're actually not very great today. Uh, there's 20 of you. Uh, you're really kind of just in the middle there. There's about 40 of you who really, you know, we don't do that. And actually, we're really good often at, at hiding how we're feeling. Because um, maybe we don't really, going back to what I was saying, we don't really want to, to share and maybe praise is something that actually doesn't come easy to us. Um, or rather, kind of praise as we think it should be done doesn't come easy to us. Maybe the, the experiences we've had or what we see others doing. You know, maybe we're more of the crowd, if we're honest. Actually, we respond to God doing something. If we see something happening, then yeah, we'll be there praising God. Um, but in reality, um, it's not our kind of first and foremost thought. Or because we gather on a Sunday, well, that's what we do on a Sunday, isn't it? So we, we praise God. Um, but the rest of my week actually doesn't really fit in because I've just put it in this box that says Sunday, um, rather than actually saying, how is this part of my life? So I want to just suggest a, a few brief practical thoughts. 
that hopefully might help us think, how do we apply this to our lives? How do we actually take this forward? And so how can we grow in our praise? So it's not saying where we're at right now is any kind of a negative place to be in. It's saying just how can we take that step forward? And so initially, I just want to suggest we start each day with God. Now, maybe some of these things you do already, uh, and you've got things that you could suggest now, but, but actually, how can we just make that decision? So actually, I'm going to start each day with God. And it's not about the length of time, uh, you know, because there's a notion uh, often that unless you send a certain amount of time, um, we haven't quite made it yet. Um, and as soon as someone stands at the front and says, well, I spend an hour in prayer every day, that is the benchmark then that we work to, which is absolute rubbish. Um, you know, it could be actually it's two minutes. So I'm going to spend two minutes in praise every day. Maybe it's 10 minutes. Maybe it's half an hour. Maybe the time isn't actually with where you're at in life something you need to worry about. Um, maybe actually for you, it's saying, I'm going to set myself a timer, um, whether on my phone or the cooker or whatever it is, and I'm going to set it for two minutes because then I'm not thinking about how long I've got left. Um, I say, and until it beeps, I'm just going to tell God how amazing he is. And that's how I'm going to start praising him every day. Because ultimately it's about the heart. And I think as if we set our direction right at the beginning of the day, uh, in James 4 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. you know, if we give that time over to God, that's going to impact how we go through uh, the rest of our day, the, throughout our weeks. And undoubtedly, I believe it will enable us to praise him like we should. Secondly, I'd suggest, how can we be thankful? And instead, maybe, of kind of just verbally saying thank you uh, and telling God, actually, could we actually write down the things that we're thankful for? Um, and it may be, actually, I'm just going to think of 10 things. So again, I'm not trying to fill you know, endless sheets of paper. or that's I'm going to think of 10 things. Um, Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 16, 34 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And maybe it's actually putting those 10 things right next to the kettle. Because um, I'm guessing most people make a cup of tea or use the kettle, coffee or whatever. Or if it's not that, put it by wherever you, you, know, you make your cold drinks, if you never drink hot drinks. I know some people don't. You know, whatever it is, find a place that you go to. So whenever you come back, you could be reminded of those things that you're thankful to God. And you just be reminded how you can praise God because of who he is. And then over time, you can develop that and change them. Um, but also, that means that when you have those days, which let's be honest, we all have, where you're struggling and it's a bit rubbish, and actually I don't feel like praising God, I spot that, and I can be reminded of what God has done and who he is, and just how amazing he is, and praise him uh, like I should. Thirdly, I'd want to suggest we can enjoy creation. You know, we have the greatest inspiration for praise. We've heard about it this morning, um, all around us. Um, and I think particularly um, living where we live here in the south of England as well, it's pretty good. You can go to some parts of the world uh, where it's pretty grim. You know, imagine being out, living out in Siberia. It's not going to be the easiest place to step out the door and go, wow, God's amazing. Um, maybe for some it would be. Psalm 95 says, in his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. You know, when was the last time that I just went for a walk because I wanted to see God's glory. Just because. And again, that's be a long walk. Or when was the last time that actually at the end of the day, I stepped out the door and simply looked up at the sky and just went, wow. God, you are amazing. I can't even see the end of your creation. I can see these dots. Um, and they are, you know, so far away. Um, but how can I take the opportunity that is literally around me and take those moments uh, to praise God like I should? And then fourthly, I just want to suggest you could learn a psalm. I sat with a church member uh, a few weeks ago, um, and they're not able to be with us regularly, but they tune in um, regularly. And they shared one of the psalms that they learned over the years. But what was so powerful was this wasn't simply words that they'd learned by rote. I mean, in, you know, I go into, um, with Caroline and others sometimes, we go into the primary school, we do assemblies, it gets to the Lord's Prayer, um, and it's one of those parts where you kind of, they just repeat it. And for many of those, it's one of those things you just learn, and do they actually know it? Do they actually make any difference? But hearing this lady recount this psalm 
was just one of the most amazing moments because it was just alive in her, uh, the power of these words. And maybe it's actually saying, I'm just going to start with a single verse. I mean, there's loads within the psalm. Psalm 8, verse 9, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How about just learning that? So then wherever you are, whatever you're going through, that can just be recorded. God, I'm just going to praise you. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I'm stuck in traffic. I'm going to be delayed. Um, and, you know, people keep switching lanes, which is really annoying because uh, it doesn't help the flow of traffic. You know, but Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth? Maybe over time, it's actually saying I'm going to learn a whole psalm. Psalm 100 um, would be one that I would recommend. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And you might sit there and think, I could never learn that. But actually... Uh, you know, we learn the songs we sing on a Sunday. We learn uh, various things. It's just actually being willing. You know, this is something I'm going to commit to. This is something I'm going to persist in because actually I want to have that resource uh, of words that will just praise God there to whatever is going on around me. So they're just four ideas, but I think what's key and what I'd really want to encourage us all to do is to do something. It may be one of those. It may be something else. Um, that God's been prompting you about, maybe for, for some time, but actually say, how am I going to grow and develop uh, my attitude and the outworking of praise uh, in my life? But coming back and just finishing with the, the crowds in Luke, you know, we have really but snapshots here of a series of moments. As I said, there's many others we could look at, um, and, and there's probably many others that were not necessarily recorded other things that went on, other conversations uh, that took place. But what is evident is that they praised Jesus. And, you know, their praise came as a response to the things that he said. You know, as we heard from last week, you know, he taught from a young age uh, in the temple. Uh, The things Jesus said impacted their lives and they responded in praise. It was the things he did, you know, the healings, the miracles, the signs, the wonders. You know, if those of you who've been uh, to Galilee uh, and you've had the privilege of going out on a boat and you suddenly had that, this is where Jesus calmed the storm. Uh, You know, just what that would have been like. You know, they praised him because of the things they hoped and believed that would come. You know, that he was going to come and deal with the Romans. Not quite in the way... Uh, they anticipated. And once again, there's nothing wrong in any of that. But I asked myself that question, is that enough? Is that enough as my offering? If my praise is simply a reaction to what I see Jesus do and witness uh, him about. You know, I believe that challenge is to, to ask, how, how can I cultivate? How can I grow? How can I develop not just a reaction to the things that go on, but actually an attitude of praise. That is part of who I am. You know, it is that constant thread running through my life, that it becomes a foundation to all I am, to all I do, and a reality no matter what is going on around me. That's the challenge. And that's the invitation that I believe is set before us. If I can invite the band to come back up. We're just going to pause for a moment. And we're just going to take the opportunity just to be still. And just in the stillness, that prayer is that the things that God is saying to us, the things that he's longing for us to grapple with will be the things that we cling on to, that we press into, that we go, okay, how am I actually going to outwork this? How am I going to share this with someone for that accountability? But that all else will, will slip away. So let's just be, be still. And then Emma's going to come and pray.
in the stillness. Renew, transform our attitude of praise. Because Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Come restore, come revive, come inspire our attitude 